Welcome, welcome back. Someone with me. A conversation on this year's theme. You know, the whole encounter is built around the theme. And we have two exceptional guests today to discuss this. Um, a longtime friend, Archbishop Christopher Pierre, and uh, a new friend, Bishop as well, Eric Varden from Norway, okay? Now let me read a summary of their uh, bios. Archbishop Christophe Pierre was born in Rennes, France. After completing his primary education and secondary education between Madagascar, France, and Morocco, he attended the major seminary of the Archdiocese of Rennes and the Catholic Institute of Paris. He has a master in sacred theology and a doctorate in canon law and started his service in the diplomatic corps of the Holy See in 1977. An infinite number of appointments followed from New Zealand to the islands of the Pacific Ocean to Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Cuba, Brazil, the permanent mission of the Holy See to the United Nations in Switzerland Elected titular Archbishop of Gunela, he received the Episcopal consecration in France. Archbishop Pierre has been apostolic nuncio in Haiti, the papal representative to Uganda, apostolic nuncio to Mexico, and now apostolic nuncio of the United States. And that's a lot. So I don't know what I'm doing here on this stage, but... <laughs> Eric Varden is younger, so I can compete. <laughs> he was born in Norway in 1974. I mean, he spent 10 years in, at Cambridge, earning a doctorate in historical theology. In 2002, he joined uh, Mount St. Bernard Abbey, home to a community of Trappist monks. And during three years spent in Rome, he taught Christian anthropology, Gregorian chant, Syriac at the Pontifical Athenaeum of Sant Anselmo. He has been the superior of his community from 2013. In 2019, Pope Francis appointed him Bishop of Trondheim. Among his books are The Shattering of Loneliness, which I have read, <laughs> The Entering of Twofold Mystery, I left out uh, milking cows and brewing beer, but as a true Trappist, that's also part of his life. So here's the floor to you. Thank you. I suddenly realized that I could have been the father of this young man. <laughs> But he doesn't look like me. <laughs> I would be very proud to have a son like you, you know? So thank you. Thank you for animating this, this time. Uh, you know, I, I've read in my uh, traveling last week this book, you know, mainly in the plains, because that's where I spent my life. <laughs> and uh, this book is... Um, called The Shattering of Loneliness. For a man, for a person who is not uh, familiar with the English language, you know, I had to go and uh, open my dictionary to see what is the shattering of loneliness. But as a matter of fact, I, th I think it expresses very well uh, what you want to say in your book and, uh, and uh, you know, the theme of this encounter. You know, this uh, father, uh, Bishop, Eric Varden is a monk. It's interesting, you know, to have an encounter with a monk after the whole story of the metaverse. <laughs> <laughs> so may I say, we go from the virtual to the real. Unless, unless the life of a monk is also uh, kind of a virtual life, but you will, you will uh, tell us what it is all about, you know? Uh, but on the other side, you know, what we have presented and which is quite puzzling in a way and very interesting before, you know, the metaverse, the social communication and the new way of communicating today 
is really the real world. It's the world where we live. So what is a monk, which, you know, comes from a, a tradition, is basically, I think, the tradition of monastic life come back to Jesus Christ, mainly, you know, Saint Benedict and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> what is the, the... And then, of course, this man, like myself, you know, he was, his vocation was a trappist. I don't know if you know the trappist. Maybe you could explain it. To, to the audience today, what is also a Trappist monk, you know, he's a, he's a kind of special kind of monks, you know. <laughs> and he, was, he became even the abbot of a monastery in England, you will tell us. But then the Holy Father called you to become the Bishop of Trondheim, which is one of the most ancient bishopric, you know, of, of the world, you know, in, the, in, the, in Norway. And you, now you have, I think, uh, two or three priests in your diocese, or maybe a bit more, <laughs> huh? and 18,000 18, Catholics, but you know, a huge territory. It looks a little bit like Alaska, you know, where, uh, you know, the, for the moment there is no bishop in, uh, in Fairbanks, and my job is to try to find a bishop for that. Maybe you could go to Alaska, Fairbanks. <laughs> <laughs> He's accustomed to that, you know. But no, no, don't worry, you know, because I, I'm lower than the Pope, so I have no power to. <laughs> so, uh, first, first and foremost, uh, tell us your, uh, you know, who you are as a monk and as a bishop monk, and what is a, what is a, what is a Trappist, by the way? You know, because I think it's good to hear that from that. You know, there is, you have a good reference. You call Thomas Merton was also a Trappist. You know, in the monastery of uh, Gethsemane in uh, Louisville, huh? Louisville, as they say in, uh, in America, you know. And uh, so, you, so t tell us a little bit of your story first. Yeah? Well, to answer the question, what is a Trappist? Um, what is a monk? Um, it's a story told from the ancient tradition that um, a visitor to the desert asked one of the desert fathers, well, what is a monk? What do you do all day? And this man said, well, I fall and I'm raised up. I fall and I'm raised up. I fall and I'm raised up. And that's the monastic life in a nutshell. <laughs> it is a life of conversion, uh, which is oriented by a desire uh, to know and see God as he is, and as he has revealed himself in Jesus Christ, and to know Christ as our, as my life, my joy, and my peace, but not on my own, um, in a fraternal communion with other brothers. Um, so sometimes, um, only once in the Holy Rule, does St. Benedict speak about the monastery in terms of a body? He speaks of the corpus monasteri, the body of the monastery. But in some ways, a monastery is the church in miniature. It is the body of Christ in miniature. So we try to live that ecclesial experience deeply and, um, well, as, by the grace of God and by God's patience as credibly as we can. Well, you know, the monks... They don't speak in a, uh, they always speak in a useful way. You know, I remember when I was a child, I used to go to, to frequent a, Actually, one day I wanted also to become a Trappist monk, but it did not happen. Uh, and uh, that was a monastery in, uh, in Brittany, where I, uh, in Timaduk. Huh? And uh, I, I was fascinated by the, the fact that uh, the... The monks at that time, I don't know if it continues like that, but the Trappists did not speak. They spoke like, uh, you know, the people who did not, by, by signs. Yeah? And they always spoke to their superior, and, but, but they, they used the sign all the time. So, the <laughs> so they spoke, but in a different way. Yeah? So, uh, but the problem is that uh, you wanted to, to, as you said, and I think it would be good because it would help us to understand what you have written in this book, The Chattery of Loneliness. 
Your life is a life of conversion. A life of the second things. Uh, uh, what, what was the second point? You well, well it's, it's, it's a life of service and, 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 uh, and primarily a, li a life of worship. Uh, a uh, life of and, worship, and, 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 and a life prayer. of encounter with hmm? Christ. And, and I would like to question you about that because this is what you are talking about. Uh, and then a life of community. Mm -hmm. you, you, are, you are the church. And I think in, a, in some way we have all the ingredients of what a Christian life is all about. And, huh? and, and ultimately, a, I mean, a, a monk doesn't pretend to be anything special. A, a, a monk or a nun is simply a Christian who tries to um, live a coherent Christian life and experiences worked out this form of life which provides certain props mm -hmm. and, um, and a tremendous inherited wisdom uh, that can be uh, a help to realize that purpose. In the, in the introduction of your book, and I recommend you to read the book, it's very, you know, it's a kind of, a, uh, you, when you read this book, you are accompanied by a monk who helps you precisely, you know, to discover your own reality your own life, you know? And uh, in the introduction, you actually give your life story. I would like to take a, a, few, a few points. You, you know, as a child, you, you, you recall that uh, you had a kind of sudden encounter with suffering. Mm -hmm. And tell us about that. Because that's, I think it's, it's quite important because it's the, it was the beginning of a new life and you were about 10 at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think it was a kind of experience that most of us would have had when, you know, you're a child, you live your fairly carefree life. I mean, I had a very happy childhood. And then suddenly you realize that the world isn't as it should be. Um, and in my case, my, my father was a country vet um, and he'd been out um, just doing the round of sick animals as normal and we were gathered around the lunch table and I was about 10, as, as you said, and he told us about one of the encounters he'd had that day. He'd gone um, to a farmer uh, who had a, a, a cow that needed treatment, and the, f the, father, the, the, the farmer had been out in the fields making hay. And because it was a hot day, he'd taken his shirt off, and so he came shirtless to greet my father. He was no longer a young man, and my father could see the scars of lashes on his back. Um, and he told me or told us that this man had been in captivity during the war um, and had been very savagely treated um, and still bore the marks of that savage treatment on his body. And that was the extent of the story, really. It was just factual information. But it sort of cut me to the quick because, I mean, I, one encounters warfare uh, on the news, even as a child, you see terrible images on television as a child, even in the 1980s, even it was much worse now. Um, but it was the first time I'd realized, as it were, the presence of the mystery of evil and suffering in my vicinity. I didn't personally know this farmer, but I could know him. I mean, I, I, I could accompany my father next time he went there. And, um, and that pierced something in me. And even as a child, I felt a strong desire to try and understand what this was about. How, I mean, is there a way of making sense of something which is senseless, which suffering is, which pain is? And uh, in that respect, I think it's true to say that my journey of searching began at that point. Making sense of what is senseless. I think or at least of what seems senseless. Uh, seems senseless. Yep. We do not understand. I think it's, uh, when I read that, I was amazed because I said, did it happen in my own life? And I think it did. But maybe I, I didn't, I, I need to remember that and to measure what has been my life from these quite events. Mm -hmm. And I think you, you said it very well. You know, it's a, at some stage, there was something which was a new beginning. The, the mystery of evil means the mystery of the reality. You know, the reality is not all beautiful. Mm -hmm. 
and it hits us, and then maybe it's the beginning of uh, a search. And I think your whole, whole life has been this kind of search. And I, and I think just to pick up that point from earlier about the monastic life as well, because the, uh, and to carry on from the very interesting discussion earlier, you know, one of the things that happens when you join the monastery is that you, you go into this universe where you're f entirely freely cut off from a lot of stimuli. Um, you know, you, you don't uh, watch TV, you don't listen to the radio much. I mean, you, you, I mean, now the internet belongs in monastic life is everywhere, but one tries to use it with caution, and in the, in the novitiate, probably not at all. So you're used to being bombarded by images, uh, stimulus, um, influence, and suddenly you find yourself with nothing. And that can be extremely bewildering. And for some people, that bewilderment is more than they can bear. But what you find, if you stick with it, is that as the stimuli from outside reduces, lots of things start surging from within, and you start realizing all the baggage you're carrying, both of good things and of not so good things of happy things you've experienced, of painful things, of beautiful things you've seen, of ugly things you've seen. And what's interesting is that you realize you remember much more than you thought. Um, and you start realizing the importance of actually taking care about what I consume in terms of stimulus and imagery, because it stays there. And you also begin to encounter your own poverty as a human being and, you know, we talked about the mystery of suffering, of pain, of violence. And the fact that in me, it's not just that the world isn't that is as it should be, but I am not as I should be. Um, and this drama is being played out in me. Mm -hmm. There's another, perhaps less well-known monk of Gethsemane, but an extremely readable author, Father Matthew Kelty. Um, who's published several collections of sermons, and in one of those sermons he talks about his work with horses at Gethsemane. And working with animals is very revealing because animals aren't pushed around the way we try to push people around. And he speaks of one occasion when he worked with this horse that just wouldn't do what he wanted it to do, and he realized that he was possessed of a great rage. Mm, yes. um, and he realized that he carried him in himself an aggression and a destructive potential that he hadn't known. And so that the, the struggle to make sense of disorder mm -hmm. and of evil isn't just out there, but it's in here. And that's when it starts becoming a bit terrifying, but also very interesting. Uh, you know, this... this uh you know, this pro process which has started at that moment. You said that uh, there were days when uh, this knowledge was crashing, you know, the knowledge of evil, the knowledge of who, who, who I am in this world so difficult. Yeah? Still, I, I had that not acquired it when I did. I might not have noticed the light that shone in a sudden into what seemed a starless, Darkness. Mm -hmm. Explain us to that, you know, a little bit, because it's interesting. You know, you, you suddenly discover that there was, a, you know, in your search, a light somewhere, which is no, was not necessarily coming from outside and still was coming from outside, but was very much inside yourself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and this <coughs> is the story of your, your life. But uh, how did it start and how it did it develop, you know? But I think at two levels, because at one level there, there, there was, I mean, this is sort of my adolescence and early adulthood. It wasn't as if all this happened when I was 10. Yes. Yeah, no, um, no, no, no. <laughs> but this is interesting because uh, your book is about the memory. Mm -hmm. You spoke about the memory, you know. The, but, you know, the, the growth of our life is also uh, uh, comes from the fact that we appropriate mm -hmm. ourselves. We make memory of many things. Mm -hmm which constitutes ourselves, mm -hmm. and this is your book, so please. And I think, well, to, to pick up your question, I think w w when you start being sensitized to, just, I mean, to all the suffering in the world, um, 
And now, you know, the world as it is now is such that one dares hardly switch on the news because you wonder, I mean, can I actually face it today? Um, but once you realize the extent of suffering that is out there and just how wicked people can be, you start also realizing how extraordinary it is that there is such a lot of gratuitous goodness. <laughs> Um, and that there is that depth of kindness that you can meet in people and hospitality and generosity and, and non-judgmental openness and the desire to help. And you start realizing just how amazing that is. So that was one instance, I think, of that light that I refer to there. But then, in addition for me personally, there, there was... The, the discovery of a supernatural dimension to this whole um, conflict, if you like, um, that happened for me through an, through an encounter with music. Um, it was through listening to the, through the, to, to the second symphony of Mahler, the Resurrection Symphony, um, that something quite mysteriously was, it was as if a door was opened in me. <laughs> And I realized that there was in me a, a level of sensibility and a vulnerability that I hadn't been aware of. And I had that sudden certainty there and there that I carried in me something that was greater than me, that was somehow a presence. Mm -hmm. And I had that experience listening to the music and I thought, well, it'll be interesting to reflect on this when it stopped. <laughs> Um, tomorrow morning, but that wound, if you like, or that openness remained, um, and that certainty that there was something in me that exceeded me, and that was looking at, that, that was seeking its resonance outside of myself, was for me a, an important turning point. You said, uh, uh, having encountered, recalled this benevolence mm -hmm. that you met in this experience, of the encounter with the beauty of this piece of uh, the resurrection of Mahler, you know, the, yeah. the, 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 that's the symphony. <coughs> uh, you said, uh, I recognize it, a personal presence. Mm -hmm. I wanted to pursue it, learn its name, discern its features. There was a kind of curiosity of a personal presence. What do, what do you mean by that? Well, I think, First of all, the fact that it was, it was pretty clear to me, or at least I suspected that, that, that what I'd encountered as a kind of presence um, was a personal presence, that it, it, it wasn't, as it were, just an extension of my own personality. And that if it was a personal presence, it, it would somehow be nameable. Mm. And so I started tentatively yes, yes, yes. seeking for that name um, through reading, through attempting to pray, through beginning to read the scriptures, and eventually through encountering a, a, a praying community. You know, uh, when I was reading that, I was also thinking about the experience of Giussani, you know, at some stage when, uh, you know, he, he said the, the, the encounter with a presence, you know, which you were actually uh, confronted with, uh, and you started, you, you, you read a number of, of poets, but also uh, the scriptures, and you say, you know, uh, it was as if uh, they spoke of familiar things, called to mind forgotten memories, in this way, the Christian proposition. You know, I think in the, in the, in the percourse of Ujusani, we speak about the Christian proposition at some stage, you know, after the religious sense, you know? Mm -hmm. And the Christian propositions dawn on me from within, resonant with the vibrations of my mind and soul, even of my body. Mm -hmm. It means that uh, at some stage uh, there was come uh, a desire for you which was confronted with an encounter. Yes, and I, I mean, th th theologically speaking, one could make sense of this quite easily and um, the conference began yesterday with that beautiful reading by a text from Pope Benedict referring to the iconic nature of human beings, the fact that we are created in the image of God. And if we take that a little bit seriously, it's, 
uh, quite natural that we should carry in our being, including in our physical being, in, our, in ourselves at the most embodied level, a yearning for God and a dimension of ourselves that, that calls out for God implicitly, simply by way of being. The, the, the poet Rainer Maria Rilke refers, with, in a, I think, a wonderful phrase to the, the, the rumors of God that rush through the fevered blood of human beings. Um, and so that there is a way of making sense of that desire, the desire for comfort, mm. um, the desire to be known, to be seen, to be loved, uh, the desire for infinity mm. that we, we carry in ourselves, that, that all those stupendous aspirations are in fact true aspirations that correspond uh, to a real object that by grace is within reach and that reaches out to us. That's the great mystery. You know that I, there are beautiful sentences, you know, I cannot avoid to, to quote them because I think they, they resonate in me and I hope they will resonate in you, you know. When the, the space within which my search unfolded was the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. it happens here, I observed it first from a distance, attracted by its long, uninterrupted history. When I stepped inside, I found it a warm and hospitable space in which I was at ease. It's interesting, you know? I had discovered another environment that embraced my contradictions without compromising truth. I could stare and purify both my grief and my desire. Mm -hmm. When I realized the scope of sacramental action, that's uh, fantastic, you know, by which all that is in heaven and on earth is drawn into a single moment, the sense of things held in the hands of a broken human being to be broken yet holding, healing whole, I knew I had come home. Mm -hmm. That's your story? It is the story, in the no it's a story that's an ongoing story. <laughs> <laughs> that's very beautiful. You know, uh, I will jump for uh, the last chapter of the book because you, when you spoke about uh, the, the desire, this desire you, you also explained about, you know, it's a, and explain us because uh, you, uh, uh, the desire and the longing, what, what, is, what is your, your reflection about that? You know, what do you mean about that? Longing. Well, that is, it's, a, it, it, it's an insight that isn't my insight, but it, it's basically something I've learned from Athanasius of Alexandria. Athanasius, <laughs> Athanasius. You know, from whom one can learn lots of useful things. Um, and it, it dawned on me, and I could sort of verify this from experience, that there is a very useful to distinction to be made between desire and longing. And it's fortunate that in English there is a lexical difference, uh, that we have those two terms that stand for different things. Um, in the Romance and Latinate languages it's much more complicated because you have derivatives of desiderium standing for the two. But basically, in, in Athanasius' terms, um, desire, which for him in Greek was the word hedone, which we, use in the, which we use in the word hedonist, you know, someone who lives for pleasure. Um, for him, desire is something that originates in me and that seeks to satisfy me. Uh, there's nothing, if you like, ecstatic about desire. Um, it's an instinct or a craving that wants to be met and satisfied. Whereas longing for Athanasius, and his word for it is potos, originates from outside myself. What I long for is something that, as it were, calls to me from a distance, and my longing is the resonance awakened in me. 
And it's interesting, I mean, it interests me anyway, because I'm a bit of a nerd in these things. Um, but um, in, it, it <laughs> us. In, in older English usage, um, you didn't use the, um, the, the verb too long with yourself as the subject. But the phrase would be, it longeth me. So I am the object of longing, not the subject of longing. And so longing is a, my longing is a response, implicit or explicit, to a call that comes from outside myself. And I think once we've made that categorical distinction in our minds, it helps to make sense of lots of things. Well, is it not something which is uh, very important, especially in a world today where, you know, uh, uh, we are enclosed in ourselves. Mm -hmm. The world has uh, make a kind of wall, like the wall between the uh, uh, United States and uh, Mexico, you know? This, the, the dream of the, the, the Americans to have a wall between the two countries, you know? mm -hmm. We have a wall so that we can see behind the wall. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think it's so important that, uh, so it's, uh, we should deepen that, and I th I've seen the, as reading in the, you know, the works of Giussani, I think there is a permanent reflections about that, you know? My desire and my longing, and uh, uh, St. Athanasius, you, 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 you reflect about that, tells us that uh, it's part, it's constitutive of our humanity, Absolutely. this longing, which mm -hmm. is very interesting. So the longing is not something which comes from above and which takes over us, but it corresponds to the deep uh, aspiration of, of the human. Mm -hmm. But the, the aspiration is not just the aspiration of a dream, of something which w could not happen. It's not just an utopia. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something which is part of us, but it needs to be, to be uh, recognized in order to, to exist mm -hmm. in us. And, and precisely, as, as you said, I think that's really important, that it is constitutional. And that's where the, 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 there's, there's a very striking resonance of the Athanasian insight in the poetry of Rilke, uh, who, 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 who says at one point, Ich weiß, dass ich aus Sehnsucht bin. You all understand. So I, 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 I know that I am made of longing, that, that, that longing is my being. Yes. No, I, I think it's Which is an anthropological definition as good as any, I think. I think it's important. Now, explain us. Why, uh, the, why our whole life would be to make memory of? What should we make memory of in order to exist and to grow and to correspond to our long, the, the longing of our, of our own being? Well, basically, I, I, if, if, if you accept um, the premise of what I said about longing just now, um, memory sort of slots into that because I think I mean, I, I, I try to develop the theme of memory in this book not simply as the mental action of recalling something, of, you know, remembering where I put my keys, um, but that we're talking about memory in a much deeper and existential sense, the way Augustine would talk about memory as being one of the fundamental faculties of human being, that the, the faculty of memoria is that in me which vaguely remembers that I am made, that I am the result of a loving intention, <laughs> um, and that I'm made to realize that intention. We're back to the iconic nature of man and what it, what it actually feels like, how we experience the fact that we're made in the image of God, because that's not just a theor theoretical notion for theologians. It's, it speaks a great truth about ourselves. So that, I think, is the fundamental challenge of, of being, of, of practicing remembrance, is to recognize that that deep remembrance in myself that my, that my origin is purposeful <laughs> um, and, th that, 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 and that I'm greater than myself. But then comes the, as I try to make sense of that, there's the further aspect of remembrance, of simply of, of remembering myself into a story. 
Um, and that's, it, it's the great pedagogy of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, you know, the, 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 we're about to enter Lent next week. We will reread the Exodus narrative. And again and again and again, we will hear, hear those solemn mosaic exhortations. You know, remember, our father was a wandering Aramean. Remember, you were a slave in Egypt. Remember, you were fed in the wilderness. Remember, underneath were the everlasting arms. So it's remembering ourselves into that narrative of redemption and then discovering the narrative of redemption as actually carrying on to this day in our individual lives in and through the church. You know, the, the prayer of the Jews as was remembering. You remember, you know, the, mm -hmm. how do you call it? In, the, 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 the Jews re were repeating that five or six times a day, you know? Remember, uh, and basically our... Uh, we remember things which was happen in my life, in our life, but in our history, we are part of an history. Mm -hmm. I mean, this story tene, uh, has as an origin God Himself, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, uh, being Christians is to enter into this act of permanent remembrance. Mm -hmm. and, and also, and, and, and within the logic of a of a sacramental reality, which is, I mean, the, 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 the church is a sacramental reality first and foremost. That remembrance is more than just notional and theoretical. Um, you know, when each day at Mass we hear those words, do this in memory of me, that isn't just, you know, write down on a little yellow post-it note what this is about, but it's about making that remembrance our own. And I think we can verify from our experience that it is possible to enter into that remembrance in such a way that we can say in the first person, well, actually, I remember that. I remember that Christ is risen from the dead. You know, Jesus said to these disciples at the end of this uh, three years of education in his own presence, mm -hmm. you know, he said, actually, Jesus did not celebrate the Eucharist every day. The, the only Eucharist which was celebrated, as far as I know, by Jesus was the last one, the last supper. The first one, the, 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 the first three years was just a relationship with him, an encounter. And uh, at the end of this, this encounter, uh, Jesus sat at the table with his disciples and celebrated La Pasqua. Mm -hmm. so you also had beautiful words about La Pasqua. Maybe you could elaborate on that one. And uh, celebrated the Eucharist. And he said, take it, come, eat. This is my body, this is my blood. And do it in memory of me. So we, we are being called now to, to live our life in memory of this encounter, mm -hmm. which, by the way, through the power of the resurrection, will be today. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this is a Christian life, you know. And also the fact that that remembrance is, it spells commitment on my part because it's a, it's a remembrance of a covenant mm. uh, and it's a covenantal remembrance. And, and as we know, even from political life, covenants are always bilateral. The unilateral covenants don't tend to go very far. Um, so when, when I say, yes, I do remember, and I say amen to this remembrance, I, always, I also commit myself uh, to realize that remembrance credibly in the way I live um, and, and to try and live it out coherently and, and in a way that is life-giving. You know, I, I would like to say that because, as you know, the Catholic Church in the United States, you know, is uh, as entering into a, a process of Eucharistic renewal. And uh, while reading what you were, uh, especially the chapter on the, on the Eucharist mm -hmm. precisely, I think it would be good maybe to, to help that so that we, we, we know what we are speaking about. You know, when we speak about Eucharistic renewal. You know, a lot of, we have, uh, we have seen that a lot of people do not re believe in the real presence, you know, of Christ in, in, the, in, in the Eucharist. So we try our best to help people to, to, to believe in the real presence. But how could people could believe in the real presence if they have not been led 
to this personal encounter with Christ? And how, so uh, wh what would be, I think it's a question mark I have, you know, uh, uh, in a secularized world as well, where basically uh, a lot of people, especially young people, have been separated. Mm -hmm. Their life has been separated from, from the mystery of God's presence. I think we need really to make a, a strong effort of evangelization. This is what we are talking about, you know, uh, as, uh, as a preparation to the Eucharist. And, and, it's, and, it, and so, it's also, and, and it, again, it's, about, it, it, it's, it's about living with, living committedly within the covenant, isn't it? I mean, it, all, it always strikes me in the, in the Byzantine liturgy. You know, you have the first part of the Eucharistic celebration, which is the liturgy of the catechumens with the readings and everything. And after the readings, the catechetical part, and after, when the altar is prepared, you know, the deacon comes out and, and calls out very sternly, let, let all catechumens depart, let all catechumens depart, let all catechumens depart, because the next stage of the celebration only makes sense if you have made your own personal commitment to it, um, to, 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 to make of that, as it were, the hermeneutical key of your existence and to carry it out. Because otherwise, there's, there's always, I mean, there's the terrifying risk that even, I mean, if, if div, even divine things, if they're, if they're instrumentalized for human purposes, they can become the object of idolatry. There, there's that, I think, a, a tremendously powerful parable in the first book of Samuel, you know, when the people have conquered the land, so that's all done, and the exodus is a bit of a, 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 a distant memory and they're in this perpetual warfare with the Philistines, and someone has the bright idea, well, let's, we've got this big battle coming up, let's bring the Ark of the Lord into the battle, and the Ark will protect us. And the Ark of the Lord, remember, in ancient Israel, was a sacrament of presence that lived in the tabernacle. So the Israelites, for pragmatic purposes, um, as a kind of a talisman to win the war, bring the ark with them, sure that, you know, if, if, if we carry this, everything will be all right. And then remarkably, God surrenders the ark to the Philistines. And that leads Israel to a profound crisis of, of faith. And they ask, you know, what, what's this about? Because it, it, isn't the ark the assurance that God is always on our side? Whereas, obviously, God's great prophetic message through that whole book is that, yes, I am on your side, but on the terms that we agreed on earlier. Do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I, uh, the question mark I have, even uh, with us, we, the church in the United States, where are we today? I always ask this question to the bishops. You know? And uh, where are we with the Eucharist? And, uh, you know, what is the, uh, what, uh, the Eucharist in the present time, in the present context of our culture, you know, have we done what is necessary to, for, for this, you know, this approach in order to, to realize the power of the Eucharist uh, between the encounter and the resurrection? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, so and, that's and also, and, and, and you the, speak of idolatry, yeah. you know, and, 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 and what, and the, what the, is the danger there? The, 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 the force that is present in it, I had the joy and the privilege of the last couple of days to preach a retreat um, to a group of priests, and um, um, on Thursday we celebrated a devotive mass to um, Christ's eternal high priest, simply using the prayers from the, from the missal, and there's, there's an offertory prayer which is staggering. Um, it occurs during the, I think on Monday Thursday as well, in a slightly different form, which says, you know, every time commemoration of this victim is made, the mystery of our redemption is present. Um, and the question is, I mean, do I live within that mystery? The mystery and, 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 of and, and our redemption. And do we ecclesially live within that mystery? Uh, uh, Actually, Christ, Christ, when he, he gave the Eucharist to the disciples. He wanted them to leave the mystery of his own, of the redemption we, and of his own death and resurrection. Mm -hmm. You know, that's basically what he was invited to do. Mm -hmm. Do this in memory of me, with me, and 
because I will be with you until the end of time. And that's what the church you spoke about in your community is all about. And, and, and I think that, I mean, to come back to what we talked about earlier on, that, that, that's, that, that's profoundly at the heart of the, of the monastic mystery. Yeah. Just as, if I may share a personal remembrance, but just as I was um, preparing to make my solemn profession, I received um, a photograph from a, a, a very learned Anglican nun whom I'd been in correspondence with and who knew that I was making this profession. And it was a photograph, a very bad photograph, of a fresco from the crypt of the monastery of Cheftonje in Belgium. Cheftonje. Yep. Yeah, which shows um, a monk on a cross <laughs> with the inscription, the legend, Homonacosesta Romenos, so the crucified monk, which you might say is not a particularly encouraging image to receive <laughs> <laughs> a couple of days before your solemn profession. This is why he was made a bishop. <laughs> <laughs> but then on, on, the, on, on the back of that photograph, she'd written in a slightly trembling hand because she was old then, but words that for me became one of those sort of paradigm shifts. Uh, and she said, here is an image of a Christian so fully conformed to Christ that he no longer contemplates the suffering Christ on the cross, but looks out on the world that Christ is saving through the eyes of Christ crucified. And once you, I mean, it's a perspective that at least I needed quite a lot of time to try and interiorize. I'm not quite sure I've interiorized it yet. Um, but I think it takes us right to the heart of, um, of what, what, what our deep Christian commitment is about, both in terms of its earnestness and in terms of its grace and, um, and joyful promise. You know, we are about to, to finish, so I would like to, to read um, a small sentence and elaborate a little bit more. So you, you, at some stage, you, you speak about uh, uh, the story of Seraphim. You, yes, you, you Seraphim, Seraphim. So Seraphim was a dialogue. It's a kind of long story, you know. I think it's come from Dostoevsky, is it? No, no I mean, he, 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 yeah, he, yeah. he would have known it and used it. But yeah. mm. So Seraphim shifts the perceived finality of the Christian condition from the realm of behavior to that of being. What for most Christians seems to be an end is in fact, he insists, but a means, an indispensable means but a means all the same. The gospel offers more than a moral code. It proposes the transformation of the human person. You know why? You know, this sentence for me is a light for what happens in this country mm. and maybe also in our church. You know, that the tendency that we have to see our a commitment in the church on, as a kind of moral commitment. And, uh, you know, and this is a good one, by the way. You know, uh, uh, but we, and then there is a kind of uh, explanation about the, the story of the, the virgins. You know, five but, but, virgins. But in, in, in fact, it's, it's a remark that, that Seraphim makes by, by way of expanding that story. And, and I was fascinated earlier to find that story uh, referred to and expanded in the context of cryptocurrency. <laughs> um, but because it's exactly the same point. I mean, uh, Seraphim didn't know about cryptocurrency because he died in 1853, um, I think. But um, his point is precisely that the really crucial thing isn't what is transactional, isn't what c you can just go out and get from the shops, um, be it a shop that provides codes of conduct, um, they're important, but at the heart of Christ's call, because says Seraphim, and mm. it, 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 it's the answer to Motovilov's question, what is the Christian life about? And he says, well, it's about the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. Yes. That is, 
it is about living the very life of Christ. And it's important, I think, also to contextualize that because th th this conversation between the two of them that takes place when Seraphim is an old man and he's lived a life of great trial. At one point when he was a hermit, he was um, attacked by burglars who thought that he had precious vessels that they wanted to steal. And he was so badly beaten that he, he was a cripple for the rest of his life. But he took on the crime of these burglars as his own crime and prayed the Lord for forgiveness for them. And so he enters into what is a very mysterious part of his itinerary when he spends a thousand days and a nights on a rock just praying the Jesus prayer, you know, calling down God's mercy on humankind, on himself as sinner, on these people who had attacked him and who for him were, as it were, representatives of evil in the world. And in praying for them, he prayed for all transgressors. And thereby, he experiences this mercy as something that actually does transform his own life and, and sets it on fire. And that is what Motovilov experiences in this dialogue, that he actually sees Seraphim as light. And Seraphim says to us, well, we're, all, when we're not all called to that degree of singular and ex excessive experience, because that, 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 that's the result of a very special call. But we're all called to enter into the life of Christ as our own Christ so that we can pronounce that Pauline formula, not just as a pious sentiment, but as something that, that it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And that presence of Christ will be perceptible as peace. Towards the end of his life, again, Seraphim said, if you acquire the spirit of peace, and remember St. Paul says, Christ is our peace. If you acquire the spirit of peace, thousands around you will find salvation. Because you will, in all your inadequacy, by the grace of God, be a pointer to Christ's gift and Christ's promise. Well, you know, I, I was thinking about that in the context, in the context of our society and the context of our church, where at times, you know, we we take uh, we are uh, obsessed by doing things, you know, achieving things, realizing, fixing, you know, that's all the time. And uh, uh, this, what we have to fix up to do, is very important, you know. For example. The, all the, the, the evil of the society, we would like to resolve them, you know. We would like to avoid abortion, we would like to, uh, to avoid uh, the, 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 the strange things like uh, gender uh, theories and so forth, and we, we, we become fighters for that. Yeah? And uh, uh, there is a, maybe also the, the danger uh, to, to enter in this kind of, to, to transform that in ideas and ideologies. And once, you know, this, uh, we, we are taken by ideologies, we become fighters for <laughs> this ideology. And those who do not share our ideas become our enemies. And this is uh, what happens in our society and what happens in our church. <laughs> so the, uh, I like this sentence because I said, well, this is okay, but it's not enough. You know, it says what for most Christians seems to be an end in, is in fact, insist, but a means, an indispensable means, we have to do that. But, but uh, the gospel offers more than a moral code. And actually, you know, are we, are we uh, as Christians defending a moral code or something else? And I think that there again, everything depends on that perspective, whether I, whether I see the world I mean, I mean, our world is in a mess, but the world has always been in a mess. That's why God came to redeem us and continues to redeem us. Um, but that we acquire eyes that can see that world precisely as a world in labor that is calling out to be saved, even very confusedly, 
and see it with realism, with discernment, make sensible and prudent and true judgments when necessary, but also to see it illumined by Christ's love. Mm. And there, one final quotation from Seraphim, but it, it's always struck, struck me as very significant. At the end of his life, after he'd gone through all that, that personal transformation himself, it was his custom when he was an old man that he would, he would greet every person whom he met with the words, Radasts Maya, my joy. In every person he met, be they saints or sinners, or somewhere on the spectrum in between, he saw, precisely because he had eyes to see, a reflection of Christ and of the image of God. And in seeing that reflection, his own heart rejoiced. And I dare say that by being seen in that way, the other might have discovered a new dimension of themselves. We have nearly finished. Why did you call your book The Shattering of Loneliness? <laughs> well, it had, it had to be called something. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good word, isn't it? Yeah. And, 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 and I mean, the, the, the idea I had was of, was of glass shattering. Um, that, you know, you, 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 you think you're you think you live in this goldfish bowl, which is your experience of loneliness, and then something, something happens and poof, and you realize that, no, there's actually a huge world out there, which is I, infinite. Actually, I think it's very meaningful. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>